Advised the fire is now stationary, contained and under control. As of this morning, there may still be pockets burning with smoke in and around the Boron Up settlement area. And there are still road closures in effect. However, considering the circumstances, to have this fire under control is a remarkable result. On behalf of government, I'd like to commend all our firefighters for their extraordinary efforts and to give everyone in the region a big thank you for all they've done. Today I can confirm that WA has again recorded one new case overnight of COVID-19 in hotel quarantine. In addition, Western Australia now has a first dose vaccination rate of 89.1% for 12 years and over. And I can announce today, WA has now achieved an 80% double dose vaccination rate for eligible people aged 12 years and over. As of last night, we reached 79.9%, but with the addition of today's vaccinations, WA has made it to 80%. This is an incredible milestone for our state. We are one of the most vaccinated societies in the world, and we have achieved this without having extended lockdowns, virus outbreaks, or any community spread of the virus. Behind our border controls, we have basically been restriction free since the early days of the pandemic last year. In fact, over the last 18 months, we only went into three very short, sharp lockdowns for a total of 12 days to do what was necessary to crush the virus and keep everyone safe. And even though Western Australians have lived a normal life inside our COVID-free bubble, nearly 2 million people have done the right thing and gotten vaccinated. We followed a different model to the others, and it's worked. I want to acknowledge each and every Western Australian for everything they have done over the past two years. We have been able to get through the last two years safely because of the efforts of Western Australians. Getting vaccinated hasn't just been about individual safety. It's about protecting your family, your friends, and our entire community. Western Australia, unfortunately, lost one life due to local community transmission of the virus. Sadly, in other states, many hundreds of people died and many others became severely ill. Across the world, millions of people lost their lives due to COVID-19. This is the devastating and heartbreaking reality of this once in a hundred year virus. And that's why we know that we can't take anything for granted. At National Cabinet last Friday, Australia's top medical advisers provided advice on the Omicron variant. This initial preliminary advice suggests that while the Omicron variant can be more transmissible than Delta, the early data indicates it may be less severe, especially with the third dose of the vaccine. So please, when you become eligible for the third dose, which is currently five months after your second dose, please go and get your third dose. It's so important to keep up your protection. So based on the advice at National Cabinet, and now having reached our 80% vaccination rate, we can now proceed with implementing our safe transition plan in line with when Western Australia is expected to achieve the 90% rate. Today, I can announce that WA will ease its hard border arrangements at 12.01 a.m. Saturday, the 5th of February. This date is locked in, giving Western Australians and local businesses certainty and the ability to plan and be ready for the transition early next year. This is a date that some in the community have been waiting to hear for a long time. Many people have family abroad that they've been unable to see for nearly two years. I'm sure this date will be a cause of relief or even celebration. For others, this is an announcement that will cause great concern. They or their loved ones may be immunocompromised. Some will be worried about their children or their older parents. The past two years have been good to them, while they have seen a pandemic claim millions of lives around the world. That's completely understandable. However, all the way through this pandemic, we have been careful and we have been cautious. We put the lives and livelihoods of Western Australians first and the state has been the envy of the world. With the best health and best economic outcomes, 
not just in Australia, but in the world. We have followed the health advice, but with a vaccination rate of 90% and reasonable, reasonable public health measures, the health advice is clear. We can safely ease our border controls and reconnect WA. I'm confident that this is the right time and the right way to take this important step. Western Australia's current zero COVID environment and high vaccination rate will help deliver the softest landing to minimise the impact of the virus when it enters our state and to keep Western Australians safe for the long term. However, when Saturday the 5th of February arrives and we ease our border controls, it's important to remember COVID-19 does not magically go away as much as we wish it or wish it would. We begin a new phase of pandemic management in WA. So with the ability for the virus to enter the community, a number of things will change in our approach as detailed in our safe transition plan released last month. With eased border controls, quarantine-free travel will be possible with COVID-positive jurisdictions, both international and interstate. But in order to achieve the outcomes in our modelling, we will still have reasonable and sensible controls when it comes to testing and vaccination. So firstly, with regards to international arrivals, they will still be required to return a negative PCR test result within 72 hours prior to departure and undertake a PCR test within 48 hours of arrival in Perth and on day six. But if they are double vaccinated, there will be no requirement for quarantine. Unvaccinated or those who have not had an approved vaccine will still be required to undertake 14 days of quarantine whether in a hotel or at the designated Commonwealth facility when it comes online. And there will be a cap on the unvaccinated, one that is significantly lower than the cap now in place for international arrivals. It should also note that any international border arrangements after the transition date will of course be subject to the Commonwealth Government's biosecurity settings. Secondly, domestic arrivals. All domestic arrivals into WA must be double vaccinated unless ineligible or medically exempt. I repeat, all domestic arrivals must be double vaccinated. For travel, proof of vaccination requirements will, will apply for anyone aged 12 and over. We'll also have testing requirements for those arriving into WA based on the length of the trip. If your trip into WA is for six days or more, you must receive a negative PCR test within 72 hours of departure and undertake a PCR test within 48 hours of arrival into WA. If your trip into WA is for five days or less, you must receive a negative PCR test result within 72 hours of departure, but you will not be required to undertake any tests on arrival in WA. And if you are in Western Australia, leaving the state and returning within five days or less, for example, going to Melbourne for the weekend, you will not need to undertake a test before returning to WA, but you will need to undertake a PCR test within 48 hours of arrival once you are back in WA. This information and clear charts will be available online soon that detail all of the requirements. The G2G system will continue for the time being to help manage these testing rules. And I wanna stress, these are interim arrangements based on the current health advice. They will be reviewed regularly, including a specific review four weeks after the transition date. But it's important to remember if you're traveling and you're experiencing symptoms, you should get tested regardless. And other states will have their own requirements in addition to ours that you will need to familiarise yourself with and adhere to. While testing and vaccination requirements on arrivals will slow the entry of the virus into Western Australia, it will still inevitably enter the community. We will retain strong test, trace and isolate measures to combat the virus, meaning there will still be public health measures in place. 
with strong surge capacity for contact tracing. WA's unique, unique position of zero COVID and a 90% vaccination rate means border controls can ease with minimal community restrictions compared to other jurisdictions. At transition, we will not require capacity or gathering limits. Proof of, proof of vaccination will be required for entry at nightclubs, the Crown Complex, the four major stadia being Optus Stadium, RAC Arena, HBF Stadium and HBF Park and at events with a thousand or more patrons. For venues and events, proof of vaccination is required for anyone aged 12, sorry, aged 16 and over. Other businesses may also choose to have proof of vaccination requirements as a condition of entry to protect their staff and patrons if they wish. Businesses should consider their individual circumstances and seek their own legal advice. At this point, mask wearing will only be required for public transport, taxis and rideshare services, airports and on flights, and visitors to hospitals, residential aged care, residential disability care, and custodial corrections facilities. In addition, there will still be restrictions on entry for certain remote communities. These baseline measures strike the right balance for WA's safe reconnection with the world. However, in the event that they need to be stepped up, we will do so based on health advice and hospitalisation rates at the time. While these light measures will be in place for most of WA, some regions have dramatically lower vaccination rates. As I flagged when we released the Safe Transition Plan last month, if individual reasons do not get their vaccination rates up, then further measures will be needed to protect the community. At present, the Pilbara, the Goldfields and the Kimberley have lower vaccination rates than the rest of the state. Pilbara has a double dose vaccination rate of 46.1%. The Kimberley is at 60.8% and the Goldfields at 65%. These are the only regions that currently have a first dose rate below 80%. As a result, if those regions do not reach at least 80% double dose by February 5, they will be subject to enhanced public health measures, which will be as follows. Proof of vaccination requirements will be expanded to pubs, bars, dining service at restaurants and cafes, bottle shops, other indoor entertainment venues, gyms and fitness centres. Mask wearing will be required at other indoor venues that do not require proof of vaccination, such as supermarkets, roadhouses, or getting takeaway. And no air travel into the region will be permitted without proof of vaccination for people aged 12 and over. We do not want to impose these restrictions if we do not have to, but there is no point in allowing COVID into these communities when vaccination rates are just too low. I hope these regions can avoid these measures. And there is time, time to get their two doses and protect themselves and their communities. For example, we need another 12,000 unvaccinated people in the Pilbara to roll up to meet an 80% double dose target. We are most concerned about the Pilbara. Ultimately, our reconnection effort cannot be made solely on the experience of Perth and the Southwest. When the virus comes into the state, and it will, the impact on the unvaccinated will be devastating. I implore anyone who is not yet vaccinated, regional or otherwise, to come forward and roll up for WA. There are effectively only 33 days left to receive your first dose to ensure you can get your second dose by the time the border controls are eased, if you are using Pfizer. And in order for it to be more effective, I wouldn't leave it that long. We know there are people in the community who are not opposed, sorry, we know there are people in the community who are not opposed to vaccination, but just haven't gotten around to it yet. If you're one of these people, it's time to get it done. It's just common sense. We let us, we, sorry, in conclusion, we set ourselves the toughest task of all the states and territories, achieving a vaccination rate of 90% of over 12s. 
It was designed to be the hardest to achieve because the modelling tells us that eating, easing border controls at 90% saves 200 lives. After the 5th of February, cases will begin to appear in the community. That is inevitable, but it will not be a cause for panic, it, but it will be a reminder to do the right thing. WA is in the position it's in today because all the way through the pandemic, West Australians have done the right thing. We're in this together and we will get through this together. I know the community will keep doing the right thing. Keep on top of some, base, of some of those basic hygiene steps. Keep a mask on hand. Checking in and showing their proof of vaccination when required. Staying home and getting tested when they're unwell. And getting your third vaccination dose when you are eligible. As of today, over 212,000 West Australians are eligible for a third dose, but only 15% have received one so far. As National Cabinet reinforced, with Omicron, it is so essential to get your third dose. When you receive the notification that it's time to book in, do so straight away. There will be some new things to learn as well, some of the practical requirements that we have not had to deal with in WA. What to do if you test positive to COVID? What to do when someone in your household or your workplace tests positive? We'll always follow the health advice and ahead of the transition date, we will detail those specific requirements based on the health advice at that point in time. One of the advantages of transitioning after Queensland, South Australia and Tasmania is we can watch and see what happens and what measures work and are appropriate. COVID throws up the unexpected. The Omicron variant is still in its early phases. So we always have to remember that for as long as this pandemic continues, we need to be prepared to adjust to latest health advice. But Western Australians can take heart that we are entering this next phase of the pandemic from the safest possible position. This is a big step forward for our state, but I do want to stress, all through this pandemic, we have followed the health advice. We have taken a careful and cautious approach and Western Australia has been the better for it. We have achieved the best health, social and economic outcomes in the nation and in the world. And in this new phase, we will stick to our successful approach. <coughs> Western Australians can be confident with high levels of vaccination across the community, testing and vaccination requirements for arrivals and reasonable public health measures. We have invested significantly in our health system to ensure our hospitals are ready and there is continued future investment in coming months and years. We are investing hundreds of millions to ensure local businesses affected by interstate and international borders are, not, are ready to not only compete on the international stage, but to thrive. We have seen what other states have done and been able to learn from it. We will be in the best possible position to reconnect with the world. And we would have never achieved it without, the, without Western Australians overwhelmingly doing the right thing. So before I hand over to the Health Minister, can I just say to all West Australians, thank you. Thank you, Premier. My message today is simple. Make every day count. Every day must be counted between now and February 5. We have the precious gift of time to continue to get as many people vaccinated as possible. We need to make the most of this opportunity. Make no mistake about it, COVID is coming into our state. Western Australia has had a remarkable run, as good as anywhere in the world. We have not had a community case for more than five months. We have not been wearing masks. We have not had to watch family members struggle for breath on a ventilator. We have not had to bury loved ones. We have indeed been very fortunate in Western Australia, but our blissful bubble is about to burst. Nothing can be taken for granted anymore. So we need to make every day count. Before giving you a sense of the state of play, I want to reflect on how far we have come since making our last big announcement on November 5. That was when we, when we revealed we would set a date at 80%. 
And we also outlined the likely restrictions at 80 for 90 per cent. In less than six weeks, we have administered more than half a million doses since that date of November 5. The fully vaccinated rate was less than 65 per cent. It is now 80 per cent. First doses have gone from 80 per cent to 90 per cent. It's been a really impressive achievement in less than six weeks. But importantly, we have had no cases in the community and no deaths from COVID-19. Just to give a comparison, since November 5, New South Wales and Victoria have experienced more than 53,000 positive cases and 220 deaths. They are extremely sobering numbers. More than 220 people have died in less than six weeks while those two states have been trying to live with COVID-19. For almost two years, our goal has been to prevent people from getting COVID-19 and to save lives. It is a strategy that has been highly effective. Keeping COVID out of our state has saved lives. But from February 5, when WA changes our border rules, COVID will come into our state. As I said, we cannot waste a single day. We need to make every day count. Western Australians are going to be in for a real shock from February 5. We are going to be living with COVID-19. But there is no easy way of living with the worst virus in 100 years. You just need to look at the eastern states or overseas to see how confronting it's going to be. But we have been preparing for its inevitable arrival. The McGowan government has invested an extra $2.3 billion into our health system. We have recruited more than 1,250 nurses and midwives to our hospitals this year alone, on top of the 1,200 graduates starting next year. And every day we are hiring more. Nearly 500 doctors have joined the system in 2021, and 350 graduate doctors are starting early next year. We have added 170 new COVID-19 vaccination and public health positions have been appointed and a further 300 more jobs as part of the vaccination response. We have announced 530 more beds, the equivalent of a major new hospital, and this includes 40 more ICU beds. 232 of these extra beds will be open by the end of this year. And in the middle of this, our health staff have been practicing and practicing for the arrival of COVID-19 patients in their hospitals. We have to make every day count. Now turning to some vaccination numbers. Statewide, we need about 200,000 more people to get their second, second dose to reach the 90% mark. That is more than achievable. For our Aboriginal communities, we have seen huge progress lately and it has been a real door-to-door -door effort by different agencies and organisations working together. But there is a distance to go. 57% of the population have received their first dose. About 40% are fully vaccinated. And now returning to November 5 uh, announcement, um, on this date, just 21,000 people of this Aboriginal cohort were fully vaccinated and now that is over 31,000. So there's been a really encouraging increase. We need to make every day count for our Aboriginal population. In terms of our age groups, more than 90% of people aged 50 and over who are, who are fully vaccinated are now fully vaccinated. So that's a great result. The 40-something uh, cohort, there are 82% fully vaccinated, so they're making great progress. Of those uh, 30 and over, 75%, the 20-year-old uh, cohort at 60%, and the 16 to 19s at 63%. And half of our kids aged 12 to 15 have been fully vaccinated, although we expect to see this increase significantly now that school has finished or is about to finish. So really, the biggest gains to be made between now and February 5 will be among the aged, uh, those aged 40 and under. Can I say to everyone directly, as soon you will want to travel, you will want to go to big events, 
there are literally hundreds and hundreds of places that you can get vaccinated around the state, at clinics, at hospitals, shopping centres, GPs and chemists. So if you're under 40, make every day count. Get vaccinated. This includes children aged 5 to 11. Today's announcement also presents a golden window of opportunity for parents of young primary school aged children. The federal government has opened the way for 5 to 11 year olds to get vaccinated from January the 10th. We are waiting for more details on this rollout, but we're pleased that it's finally happening. We know from international experience that young children are getting the Omicron variant and we know that they are spreading it. We need to protect them and to help them protect us all. Parents have a golden window of opportunity to get their child a first dose. So don't waste this opportunity make every day count between January 10 and February 5. And likewise, for the rest of us, it is important to get your third shot when you become eligible. This is even more important because of the Omicron variant. About 32,000 Western Australians have already had their third dose. We will be boosting the Roll Up for WA campaign in January to remind people of the importance of their third dose. This will coincide with the time that a larger proportion of the population will be eligible. Also in January, you'll be seeing a new app. The WA government is in the final stages of developing a mobile phone app to assist, assist with the proof of vaccination that is safe, secure and convenient. This is a really important day for Western Australia. We have done so well as a state. We have lived a long time without COVID-19. We have been the safest place in the world with one of the best lifestyles in the world. Nine out of every 10 eligible Western Australians have had at least one dose and eight out of every 10 are now fully vaccinated. Now we are ready to take the next big step on February 5. Until then, let's make every day count. Now I hand you back to the Premier for questions. Thank you very much. Any questions? You won't give us the detail about how the work beyond February 5, but I think you said uh, G2G beyond February 5. Is that, is that right? That you'll still apply to come into the state through the G2G process? Uh, that's correct. So a whole range of measures uh, beyond February 5, but not some of the more extreme measures you've seen in the eastern states. So uh, a few things to note. After February 5, when you're catching a train or a bus or a rideshare or a taxi, uh, you'll be required to wear a mask. Uh, if, you, uh, if you want to go uh, to the stadium, you want to go to ROC Arena or each of the HBF parks, uh, you'll need to be double dose uh, vaccinated. If you want to come into Western Australia from interstate or you want to fly interstate and come back, uh, you need to be double dose vaccinated. If you want to come in from overseas, uh, you'll need to be double dose vaccinated or else uh, there'll be a very limited number uh, of non-vaccinated places in hotel quarantine that people have to pay for uh, and uh, uh, they, uh, they will um, uh, and there'll be a, a, a low cap on that number of people coming in from overseas who are unvaccinated. So there are all sorts of rules that will be in place but basically uh, the rules we'll have in place will, re will reward vaccination. So those people who are vaccinated will be able to travel, they'll be able to go to concerts, the football, all sorts of things that the unvaccinated will not be able to do. Could you explain, uh, could you explain for all those people who were in office sweeps uh, how you came up with November the 5th? Based on health advice. Every day. Oh, sorry, uh, February the 5th, my lord. Okay. <laughs> well, look, uh, I didn't choose that. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, February. November, <laughs> November, <laughs> November. <laughs> Okay, well, a day for I must have misspoke. Um, I mean, the airlines picked uh, January 31st. Um, <laughs> Other people were projecting that it was uh, that you wouldn't get to 90% until February the 13th. Why did you get it the 5th? Based on health advice and the projections that were provided to us by our health professionals. So what we expect is the vaccination rate will slow a little bit over Christmas and New Year's, which you'd understand. Uh, we're very confident that by February 5 we will hit 90% double dose vaccination for the entirety of Western Australia. So the health advice said on or after the 4th of February. Um, 
but the thing about the Saturday is uh, it's the day after the first week of school, uh, so kids won't be required to wear masks on buses or on trains during that first week of school, uh, unless families get through that first week of school without, it, without, it, without any of that sort of you know, disruption. So February 5 was the date we selected. Does that mean that some of those tougher restrictions you were considering could be unvaccinated if we didn't reach 90%, like not being allowed to go to bars and restaurants, for example, and now not off the table? You're not worried about having to impose those? Are they still being considered? Well, if we don't get to 90%, there will be a range of measures we bring in uh, for the unvaccinated. Uh, and so that's... Uh, that's just a fact. Uh, now, we haven't settled those for the entire state. The, the area we're most worried about is the Pilbara, the Goldfields and the Kimberley, but especially the Pilbara. The Pilbara's vac vaccination rates are very low, and so uh, we need to get that vaccination rate up in the Pilbara especially. So if we don't, if we don't get it to over 80 per cent, well, then the Pilbara will have a whole range of restrictions put in place, particularly for the unvaccinated. They won't be able to fly there. Uh, they won't be able to go to a whole range of venues, uh, restaurants, bars, cafes, pubs, bottle shops, um, all those sorts of things will be put in place. I know that you haven't said the word uh, lockdown yet. Is that off the table as a result of reaching 90% or are you still keeping that in your back pocket? No, we, we won't be putting in place lockdowns uh, broadly. Um, the only thing you'd, I'd say about that is obviously if we had an outbreak, for instance, in an aged care home or perhaps a school, uh, you might put in place certain rules around those. You might have an outbreak in an Aboriginal community or a town that has very low vaccination levels. In that circumstance, a very targeted lockdown would be available. Just so you all understand, that's part of the national plan. Uh, before I get uh, all people screaming and yelling, that is part of the national plan, the very targeted measures. So you have a look at New South Wales and Victoria and those places today. There might be an outbreak in a school or an aged care home. They put in place measures to deal with the school or the aged care home. So. Uh, that's, I think, entirely reasonable. Is there a chance that Omicron variants may delay the opening beyond February 5? I don't think so. Um, very confident that will not occur. Uh, this date is locked in, barring some unforeseen emergency or catastrophe, uh, which we can't predict. Uh, but that's the nature of COVID. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's a very safe uh, bet that on February 5, this date, uh, this, this transition will occur. Most you, country hospitals don't have an ICU. I think just Bunbury does. What if there's an outbreak in the regional areas? Will people be flown to Perth for or how will Well, health will deal, deal with it in the circumstances. Uh, we've had uh, people have COVID in the past, over the course of the last two years, in regional areas, and they have gone to local hospitals. And there are protocols in place to make sure that that is safely managed. Uh, so that's the normal way you'd do it. If there was a requirement uh, for someone to be evacuated to an ICU in Perth, well, obviously that's where the RFDS comes in. So we've done this over the course of the last two years. I'm sure that we'll be able to do it again. QR codes, you, um, what's going to happen with them? And a lot, a lot of people still sign in, but a lot of people have dropped off. Do you think once, the, once COVID is amongst us, that's going, to, that's going to be the impetus to get people to get going with them? Oh, I'm sure it will. So we'll have a new app, which comes out in January. Uh, which will have all of the information on it, both uh, your QR code, your, your vaccination status, uh, all those sorts of things uh, will be available uh, in January and we'd, ex we'd expect people to transition to the new app as other states have. Very secure uh, and very, uh, uh, very uh, uh, modern uh, app will be put in place then. So that's our arrangement. QR codes will continue. You'll be able to use for all those businesses and, uh, you know, um, uh, the uh, the uh, sporting clubs and the like, they'd use the existing, um, I forget the term, uh, the thing on the wall, uh, whatever that thing's QR called. Code. That thing, the QR oh, code. No. Uh, they use, <laughs> that's what it's called. They use the existing one of those. The number of people using those um, recently has dropped off quite significantly compared to when it first came in. Is that a thing that needs to change before February? Oh, yeah. I think, I think people, once they know this data's in place, it'll be much more heavily used and uh, much more carefully used and I think a lot of businesses and other venues would expect people to use it. Can I just double check the G2G passes, so people have to apply to, to come into WA but not to go out of WA on a G2G. Uh, is that the same as other states, you know, that people still have the G2G in amongst between Victoria and Queensland? No, is that, is that no. Uh, I think other states might have copied it, some other states might have copied it. Um, but the G2G pass allows us to make sure that people are, for instance, vaccinated. We can track people if we have to contact them. So let's imagine people come in 
Um, so under the, under the system as it works, when you're coming from interstate, you'll be required to be double dose vaccinated. You'll also be required to have a test before you come in to prove that you're negative. After you arrive, if you stay more than six days, you'll be required to have a uh, COVID test whilst you're here. Um, it might actually be less than that. I'll, I'll get the exact details. Uh, when you come in from interstate, you're required to be double dose uh, vaccinated a negative PCR test 72 hours before arrival. If you're, te if you're trip to WA six days or more, you have to undertake a PCR test within 48 hours of arrival. Uh, so, you know, we need to be able to contact and, tra and, and, get in, and uh, uh, trace those people if necessary. So that's why the G2G pass will remain in place uh, over this period. Would that be a deterrent? Well, on the other hand, it's a very safe jurisdiction. So a lot of people might want to go somewhere safe. A lot of tourists, and particularly older people, often with high disposable incomes, might want to go somewhere safe and different that is uh, far more secure than other parts of Australia. So, look, uh, we're going to put this in place at least for the first month and. Uh, review some of these measures after the first month. Have you finalised the number of unvaccinated travellers from international destinations that would be allowed in? You said it was far less. Yeah, it will be far less. Uh, well, we haven't finalised it, um, but it may be down at 100 or perhaps less per week. So testing for people that are taking short-term trips interstate within 48 hours, that's a much smaller testing window than we've used throughout the pandemic to date um, with incubation periods and so on. So please explain thinking around that, why we're just doing the 48 and not the, the two-week kind of testing turnaround that we've done today? I don't understand your question. Well, two-week testing? From a, from a so, no, the, we've never had two-week. What we've had is quarantine. So you have to quarantine for two weeks. So when people are double-dose vaccinated, when the borders open, they have to have a negative PCR test within 72 hours before leaving, so New South Wales or Victoria to come here. When they get here, if their trip is more than six days, um, they have to have a PCR test within 48, day, 48 hours of arrival. Um, if, if their trip into Western Australia is um, five days or less, less, there's no PCR test required on arrival. Um, so that, that would mean they go back home. So it's basically two tests. So it's 72 hours before they arrive, and uh, within uh, six, uh, within 48 hours after arrival. So there won't be any rapid in. testing at all? Uh, well, um, on the border, rapid antigen testing. Mm. Uh, no, we're requiring PCR tests, which were far, far more reliable. Who's, who's that? Uh, I'd have to get details on that. Is that, is that the I suspect the individuals. Yeah. yeah. I'm not, there's two not ways you can do one with a referral from the GP to a private stock on, on um, uh, the legitimacy of testing and COVID certificates from overseas travellers, how are you going to ensure that they're legitimate? And, you know, overseas travellers? Yeah. It's up to the Commonwealth. We don't control international borders. So that's up to the Commonwealth and the airlines to enforce. Uh, but when they do come in, they'll have to have a G2G pass and then they'll have to have further tests when they get here. Um, and, and just on the, uh, you said the detail will be spelled out, but I think you, you said yourself, um, if you're in a workplace and you come down with COVID, do you have a, 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 an idea about what would happen in that workplace? Should, should the, everyone around them be sent home? I mean, is that? Well, that's, um, that's one of those things we'll work through over the course of the next seven weeks. So February 5 is still more than seven weeks away. So as I said in my opening statement, we can watch what happens in South Australia, Queensland and Tasmania and calibrate our rules around that to match what works in those states. So uh, as you know, in South Australia at the moment, there's a bit of chaos going on uh, with everything that's happened there. And uh, we can watch what happens there and work out what the best arrangement is uh, for uh, those, uh, for people in the workplace or people who are COVID positive and their close contacts and their casual contacts. Uh, it goes without saying that if you are COVID positive, you will be required to quarantine. In relation to your close contacts, we'll work out whether it's testing or quarantining or a mix of both. And in relation to casual contacts, we'll work out what the arrangements are there based upon the experience around Australia. So all those rules will be put in place uh, in the lead up to February 5. Is, is in a specific workplace though, like a hospital, so a nurse's 
husband tests tests positive, <coughs> are they going to be able to go to work or they'll have to quarantine as well? They're all the rules will put in place in the lead up to February 5th. The, the um, WA Health modelling suggested that with the Delta variant there'd be about 40,000 cases in that first year and around about 100 deaths. The game's now changed with Omicron. What does the modelling show about how many cases you're going to have in the first year? I don't have the details on that, I'm sorry. So there's no modelling that's been done on Omicron given this initial plan was all based on Delta and now everything's changed? Well, all, all the advice I got at National Cabinet, so just so you know, uh, National Cabinet, lots and lots of conversation around it, uh, with advice by Dr Kelly and others around um, Omicron. Uh, they were very clear uh, that it may be more transmissible, but the likelihood is it's less severe. And so that's the advice they provided us on Friday. So that's why we have not changed our approach uh, in terms of a date for opening based upon that. So um, that's, the, that's what we have at, at hand at the moment. But just so you know, over the course of um, when we do open, uh, there's all the testing requirements for people coming in to make sure that we uh, stop people who are positive getting coming in, and then all the testing requirements when they get here, both international and interstate. And then we're going to have a whole range of measures in place uh, which we can use. For instance, we, we will have a surge capacity of contact traces of 800 people able to perform these roles. We will have hundreds of additional hospital beds coming online. Uh, we'll have uh, those public health safety measures, so, you know, the mask wearing on public transport in hospitals and aged care facilities um, in place. And what's more, we'll have a 90% plus vaccination rate, one of the highest vaccination rates in the whole world, which reduces transmissibility and also ensures that if anyone uh, does catch the virus, the impact is far less on that person than the unvaccinated. There's not a great deal more that we can do. Not a great deal more. Uh, we are in a uh, unique and privileged position of having very high levels of vaccination, great health services, great contact tracing services in place, the right mix of public health and social measures before such time as the virus gets to Western Australia. But every day that goes by, we also run, run the risk of an outbreak. We have trucks coming across the border, we have ships coming into our ports, we have flight crews coming in, and we have some of the, you know, the longest land border of anywhere in the world with all sorts of tracks and everything else out there that people can come across. We run the risk every single day. So that's why our plan is to come out of this with a soft landing, with high levels of vaccination, the right measures in place to protect the state on our terms. So it's not forced on us, but on our terms, so that we do this right. Uh, in early February. Yeah. Some, some people have called for the reopening to be delayed to allow younger children uh, to get vaccinated, to have more certainty around that. Can you talk to the consideration of that? We haven't had any health advice that we should do that. Um, and what we're saying to people, as of January 10, uh, when 5 to 11s become eligible, we'd encourage people to get their children vaccinated. The impact of the virus on children is actually uh, far less uh, than on older people, but as a safety measure, please get your children vaccinated. The unvaccinated arrival cap, has that been agreed to with the Commonwealth? No, we'll advise them when we land it. And you're confident that they, there won't be any pushback from that? Well, I wouldn't have thought so. I mean, you know, this... I mean, we are a very safe jurisdiction, and the Commonwealth, I would have thought, wants people to be vaccinated, just like we do. Uh, so trying to encourage vaccination by every measure possible is the right thing to do. As you review the plan, would you consider implementing a cap on unvaccinated domestic travellers? Not at this point in time, no. For the Pilbara Goldfields in Kimberley, is there anything left to do to bring up that vax rate at all? Well, I would have thought the announcement I've made today that will open on February 5, plus all the measures that will be in place if they don't reach 80% double-dose vaccination by February 5 would be encouragement enough. But on top of that, um, we're trying to save their lives. We're trying to save people's lives, their families, their communities, the vulnerable, particularly um, vulnerable older and Aboriginal people in these parts of the state. We're just trying to save their lives. So uh, just encourage people out there to get vaccinated. The virus will find the unvaccinated. That's what they all say, internationally, interstate, where they've had COVID, it will find the unvaccinated. So you might live in the middle of the desert, but it can still find you. So please go and get vaccinated as a measure to protect yourself. Premier, just going back to the present, when Tasmania opens to other states in two days' time, will that trigger a change in its risk status? Uh, well, it all depends upon the spread of the virus. 
Um, the experience in Queensland and South Australia is they both had spread of the virus or have had spread of the virus, so we've had to change their risk status. The chances are the same thing will happen in Tasmania. Uh, we'll just wait and see what happens. So what do you say to all the people that will be basically locked out of WA in September the 5th? Because, I mean, we'll be the only state not open. We've been through this for two years. Uh, we've had closures, openings, closures, openings. Uh, but over the course of that period, we didn't have high levels of vaccination. So we are in a very um, fortunate position. We can get to very high levels of vaccination before we open. Uh, there's virtually nowhere else in the world that's able to say that. So uh, let's just do it. Let's just do the right thing for the next seven weeks. Then we can open safely, transition out of this, uh, and people can visit family and friends and the like uh, as long as they're vaccinated. And we can um, have uh, a great, well, we can have as good an outcome as we could hope for. What would happen if we reach 90% a lot earlier than February 5? It's February 5. It'll be February 5. So we have to plan around that. Airlines have to plan around that. Uh, all sorts of uh, trains and bus companies and everything else have to plan around that. It's February 5. So it's going to be very difficult for the uh, One Day International Optus Stadium to go ahead on January 30, given what's happened with the Ashes. Well, if they're prepared to adhere to the rules, well, then they can hold the, the game of cricket. Um, you know, they just need to adhere to the 14-day quarantine rules. So that's what we said to cricket. Uh, they didn't want to do that, but we said the same thing to the AFL, and they did want to do that. So that's why we held the grand finals. So it's all dependent upon them whether they want to adhere to the rules. So there would be no change to exemptions for the no. teams later on before that February 5th month? No. Just to clarify, this new app... Um, it will be replacing the WA Safe app. Is that correct? So you'll be yeah. scanning QR yeah. codes with it as well? So yeah, that's right. We'll do everything. Safe WA yeah. and GTG. So, so would you scan in and at, at the entrance to a pub or to a, an event where you need to scan in and show back? It won't be a pub. Proof, will that, that pop up yes. when you scan in? That's so, right. So you don't have to be asked for it. People will just watch you doing it. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a scanning system for the Crown Casino for the stadium, uh, RSC Arena, H HBF Park, and events of over a 1,000 people. So the new app will allow for that. It will also be a G2G pass, and it'll be a SAC WA app, all in one. Be able to download it, we expect, from January 10. Well, the Health Minister says that he thinks West Australians are in for a real shock from February 5. Do you agree with that? What do you think is going to be uh, the most disruptive impact to our lives next year? Well, it's, uh, it'll be very different. Uh, we've had a very different life to the rest of Australia and the rest of the world. Um, I talk to people, it's a funny thing. Um, you talk to people in New South Wales and Victoria, uh, they have no idea what life's been like here. As I said, I might have said at one of these press conferences before, um, I met Gillan McLaughlin during the AFL Grand Final. He did his two weeks quarantine and then, you know, was part of the events leading up to the AFL Grand Final at Optus Stadium. He was absolutely amazed how good life was here. And yet the perception in Melbourne and Sydney is somehow we've all been locked down. We haven't had any restrictions. We've had no rules. We've lived a free and open life. We've got an unemployment rate of 3.9%. They're all at 5.5%. Um, they really don't understand what life has been like here over the course of the last two years. It's been so different to their experience. We've had 12 days of lockdown in the last 18 months. We've had one person one person acquire the virus here and pass away. They've had hundreds and hundreds. Their hospitals have hundreds of people in them. Our life has been completely different. But that'll obviously change. Uh, but the good thing is uh, that we will change it on our terms when we have high vaccination levels and we have the right mix of social measures in place to protect people across the state. Uh, we have to change it. Uh, we have to move on. Uh, we can't stay... Uh, in our uh, position of uh, international and interstate borders forever. And every single day we run the risk of an outbreak in any event, despite all the measures we put in place. So we're just going to transition on our terms with high vaccination level levels and the right measures in place. Um, I don't know, it might be for the health minister, but it's just this case of a 21 month old that was presenting at PCA. I don't know anything about it, I'm sorry. Any other questions for me? Thank you. Uh, you've won. Is the level of threats decreased?